Chris. Good day. This is the Eye of the Storm podcast with the big picture update for Sunday, May 14th, 2023. Today, I'm going to be updating the SPX and the NDX, the two-year note and the 30-year bond, gold, silver, and the dollar index. And we're going to try to keep it all to under an hour. Beginning here with the SPX, it's still a pretty crazy week, and I'm starting here on the weekly chart. And because I want to show how basically that we are still within the finishing stages, but still within, starting at a top level, the, a primary B wave counter trend rally. And that started here at the October lows at approximately 35, nine, uh, excuse me, 34.91 was that low, 35.02 in the futures market. From that low, the market has been putting in a series of ABC counter trend rallies. And within it, so we're looking at a primary B wave. What will be comprise that primary B wave will be an intermediate A, B, and that C wave that we are now in. Understanding that all C waves are five wave structures. So within that C wave, we've done minor wave one, two, three, and four. So we're still within this finishing stages, but through this entire process, <clears throat> excuse me, we have actually been stuck in a pretty tight range. If we can go back to uh, December, that range was about 3,800. And then from there, it ran up to about 4,100. Then as the new year broke, we kind of increased that. So by mid-December, we were still 3,800, but we picked up the top side of that and took it up to 4,200. So from basically April, we have been stuck between 3,800 or 3,816-ish, right around in that area, up to 4,200. With a with a very strong draw or magnet, still sitting around the area of forty one fifty, and that's including the SPX. So in the SPX, we could drive it down to forty one twenty five, but it goes up forty one fifty, forty one hundred, up to forty one fifty. It's stuck in this range. Now, why would it be stuck if the market is just really trying to finish a counter trend rally? obvious reason is there is many many factors coming to light and we're in between where it would feel like no one's really telling the truth and what i mean by that is that we continue to have the battle with inflation we continue to have a banking crisis brewing underneath all of this even in the face of many of these banks telling us, oh, we're, we're solvent, we're great, we, we're not having any problems, we're doing well. And so, of course, that then forces the short covering, forces what's being done in that stock to stop and for it to reverse. And then we get the conversation that the whole banking crisis is being really put to blame on short sellers. So we're asking <clears throat> for the SEC to now investigate those short sellers. We're also asking via the Senate and the Banking Committee that the SEC needs to take a look at insider sales within Silicon Valley Bank and the other two banks, the two large fails that have already taken place. This is just, for lack of a better word, folks, a sideshow. It's totally masking over the, the true, serious, problem that still exists. Remember, I've also discussed that there are approximately $2.1 trillion at risk of loss because of bank failures. So this uneasiness remains as an underlying factor. Whether 
traders are going to catch the beef and, and, the, and the fault because they sell the stock short is not really what's underlying and, and underneath all of the problems. It continues to just be truly bad trading on the part of the banks in taking their deposits and placing them in longer term uh, strategies with treasuries. You know, buying, for example, a 10-year note and, and expecting to hold it to maturity to get that interest to then pay out to those depositors in terms of dividends. Now, that failed miserably because the same trader that decided what a great idea, let's go buy 10-year notes or 30-year notes or five-year notes or whatever, whatever instrument they're using, and not hedge it against exposure to an interest rate rise. What then happened? Well, as we already know, the Federal Reserve has gone through the, the largest increases over time that we've seen in the last 50 years. So what does it really kind of lay down to me? is that if you really want to find out what's going on, you've got to back out your history. You've got to really start looking at what came, why all of this is occurring. And for that to really take place, you're really going to have to go back prior to 2008, 2009. You're going to have to go further back to see how and what caused the late 70s rise and, and rise in interest rates, which peaked in 1981. Everybody wants to really talk about the well, there's a different set of circumstances than it is now. It's like, yes, I agree, it is. And the biggest one is that there's a ton, a ton more money in the monetary systems than there was back then. So what we want to maybe say that a 5% interest rate today in 2023 may be equivalent to a 15% interest rate in 1980. That may be of all things taken into consideration, but it doesn't belittle or reduce that what's going on now is that much worse because there's a mat much additional capital floating around out there that needs to be removed. That still remains a big problem. There are $2.1 trillion, as I said, at risk profit and loss, risk, all within the banking sector. How much of that falls to the regional banks versus the big, too big to fail banks is yet to be really revealed. We know there's a lot of risk on the regional banking level. And that's now being played out as we see they continue to come into PacWest, they continue to come in to Western Alliance, they continue to come into Zion, a lot of the regional banks, and they start hitting them. They start selling them. They pump it back up. They start shorting it again. The underlying problem has not gone away. But mind you, that even when, let's just put it this way, before First Republic actually went down, they came out and pumped and pumped the market with stellar earnings, causing this big rally in the stock, only to, within a week or two, drop 99%. That, folks, is unforgivable in my book. So that's why the SEC is going to go take a look at insider trading. What were those sales? And what were they really based on? And all fair is fair. They should. But something should have happened way before this. So the stress test that's given by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to determine the health of the banking system, that's really what failed. <clears throat> so again, our own system that created the problems, like the Federal Reserve, holding interest rates low, a ZERP, they call it, zero interest rate policy for years, for years, for decades. That is at the core of the problem. They didn't know when to turn off the spigot. They didn't know when to stop. And we went from catastrophe to catastrophe. We had the meltdown from the mortgages in 2008, 2009, caused a financial collapse. Only way out of that 
you got to pump up and refund all of the corporations that have now just suffered, right? Because we have to keep them, keeping their employees employed and they have to be able to pay them or everything goes. We go right off that glacier, right off that hill, right off that cliff, straight into what we don't even want to consider. Then we get all that going, and we have this fantastic rally. They hold the interest rates lower, continue to auction debt, continue to auction debt at, at unbelievably low rates. And then the banks able to take that and then charge us exorbitant rates on the loans, on the credit cards, et cetera, et cetera, that they continue to feed. You want more credit here, you got more credit. So now we see this catastrophe building all along, and then everybody's now back on top, and we're all living the high life again. Then we get the pandemic, boom, smack, bam, shut down the country, shut down the globe. Federal Reserve, Treasury, we've got to step in again. We've now got to create more money. We've got to push it back out there because now we have to fund everybody because nobody can go to work. Now we've got to make these big adjustments. That's another eight point some odd trillion dollars that gets pumped into the system. And we see once again, Wall Street just kind of go through the roof because what happened? People that really didn't need those stimulus checks got them anyway and put it in the market. So it's just sloshing around. Now we get into this banking crisis. Silicon Valley Bank goes down. Key Signature Bank goes down. First a couple of threatens and that is going to go down. Eventually it did. But the first two, $400 billion got pushed immediately, immediately almost overnight. Don't worry, we're going to secure all those deposits. Well, that's called stimulus. No matter how you want to look about it, they injected that capital into the system, into the monetary system. And guess what? It's still sloshing around out there. So confusing? Yes. Now, let's take a second look. I've been talking about how we're in a primary B wave. All you need to do is pick up any one of the Elliott books, any, if you got the original writings of R.N. Eliot, and look at what is described in a B wave. A B wave, in my history, has been called a sucker play. Sucker, like, oh, you're a sucker for falling for that. In that we're going up or going down on kind of false pretenses, on, on not solid fact, on not solid economic data, on not anything. We're just doing it. And so it draws in. And now consider that this whole canvas of how things get reported is just tripled in speed because of the internet, because of instantaneous news, instantaneous, you're there. And again, <clears throat> the increase in the size of the amount of money that is moving around in the market, it's gigantic. And if you need to really figure this one out, which will boggle your mind, just take a look at how many shares trade in some of these stocks. Take the average price of the day, times that number of shares. That's how much money traded there. Then add to that in the derivative markets, the amount of money that's flipping around in the derivative markets every single day. And this is just the US. We have global involvement as well. There's tremendous, and I repeat, tremendous amounts of money still there. And people are using that as an excuse of why the market can't go down. There's just still too much money. So how can the how can the Fed or how can the government, how can the Treasury really start to clear up those balance sheets? Well, if higher interest rates really aren't going to work, what we got left? Debasing the currency. All right. Letting the currency drop. If you notice, and I will be going over that in the dollar index, that'll be my last one that I'll cover today. It's It starts to rally, but it can't get itself much past what I call par. Par is 100. It can't get over one, below or really hold that strongly above 100. So it, it's presenting a quagmire into traders are and, and hedge funds portfolio managers big big trading firms big trading firms that are using hft they're in and out every day 
they make their money and they're done. But how do hedge funds, asset managers, macro traders, how are they going to position themselves? Macro traders, there's been a sincere absence of macro traders. And when we see them move in, it's because of something they absolutely have to do. Like lately, it's been they have to move money into tech. And I'll talk about that when I go over to the NASDAQ. Now, there's still a lot going on, but we're in a B wave. B waves go up or down a lot of times on misnomers, on a sucker play, on, oh, this is the belief. Oh, this is what has to happen. And we get that increase now because we have instantaneous information that is being presented to us as gospel, as true, as absolute going to happen type reporting. It's the way it is. Take it all with a grain of salt, as we say. Remember that we need proof. We need factual proof, not just a hope and women, a prayer that the banks truly are moving along at a good pace. That that risk, that $2.1 trillion risk, the profit and loss risk, so it's a risk of loss, is not going to happen. We have no clue because interest rates remain on a very fine cracking piece of ice. What's going to happen? Well, we're not really getting a lot from the Fed, but we're getting a lot from pundits that are telling us, well, this has to happen. The Fed has to do this. And let me tell you something. The interest rate cut you know, there is a possibility that they can do it. So everybody wants to now interpret, well, that means stocks got to go up. Think again. It does not mean stocks have to go up. Go and review what happens in recessions. Go and review what happens in periods of deflation. If we've just been dealing with a period of inflation, stock prices, whatever you want to call it, it's inflated. They have to deflate. That's just a natural process. Check it out. What happens in periods of deflation to interest rates, to interest-bearing products, et cetera, et cetera, and see what happens. So we're si sitting on the precipice of something. And then, therefore, I do look to Elliott Wave to kind of give me an insight as to, well, what is Elliott telling me? Okay, so back to that, Elliot, let's go back to the SPX. When I take a look at this, and we're inside of a B wave, a sucker play, a, 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 a misnomer, unreal, it's going to go. And we still, not so much right now because of how everything's been counting out, but you know, we, we've had for the longest time when I, when I was talking about a B wave, and a primary B wave, I was including the fact that it could have been an irregular B wave. And if that was the case, we'd be looking for the SPX to go above its highs of the beginning of January 2022, or 2023, excuse me. No, actually, 2022. I was right to begin with. So, but I don't feel that that is in existence anymore. So here we are in these finishing stages. Now let me, let me bring this down. So we've got the we've got the A, and now we're looking for that B wave. The first fibs that you're going to see on here are support support for what I think is coming next, and that's a primary C wave. But what really what I've gone and done is I'm looking at the support levels for this entire longer term corrective process called super cycle wave four. Now, again, I'm going to just review the breakdown. What's inside a super cycle fourth wave? Three waves labeled ABC of cycle degree. What's inside of that? Three waves labeled ABC of a primary degree, right? So in, in other words, we have ABC on a cycle degree. What's going to be in that cycle wave A? Three waves labeled ABC of primary degree. Okay, 
what's going to be in that first primary A wave? ABC of intermediate degree. We got those done. We're now in that primary B. What's going to be inside of that? Three waves of intermediate degree. A, B, and C. We're close to finishing those. What comes next? Primary wave C. What will be in that primary wave C? As we already know, all C waves are five waves. That means a five wave decline. And C waves are notorious. They're like third waves. That's their, their closest cousin, you could say, are third waves. Strong, very directional, destructive in terms of what, what can happen. If we're looking for a decline here, it will be kicked off. And again, everybody's saying I'm, I'm doom and gloom. I'm really not. I'm really not. There will be more trading opportunities inside that C wave than we can shake a stick at. You just have to be open and understand. You don't have to be married to a bullish or a bearish bias to go and play these markets. And you can make your money without having any bias or care what anybody else is doing. So it truly, truly does come down to each one of us in our own mindsets. And that's a different conversation. One I'd love to have. But when this thing kicks in, right now it is difficult to trade. Why? Because we're still inside this B wave. We're still inside this period of total indecision. Total of we don't know what to do. We need more data. We need more points to go on. And every time we get more, they don't believe them. Well, no, we need more now. Because well, we got more going on. Now, I'm going to start bringing this down because I want to take a look at what's happening inside this thing. So let's take a quick peek inside. I'm gonna bring this down quickly to the daily. Here inside the daily, here's the primary A, here we have the intermediate A, intermediate B, we're inside that intermediate C wave. Well, my first thought remains, what does Elliot tell us? Well, most often we're looking for the C wave to take out the high, in this case, the high of wave A before it completes. Well, this high is 4,195. So it's actually 4,250 in the ES. But here in the cash market, we're still just 4,200. That's all we need, 4,200. And we got pretty dang close. We got up towards 4,186, pushing towards that back at the beginning of May. And then we dropped. So what we're looking at here is continued weakness in the market, trying to balance out by getting up, balancing that strength. But now there's just too much, I hate to use the word, but I'm going to call it noise, inside the market about what the Fed has to do, what the Fed can do, what the Fed should do, what interest rates should do, what the market should do, what we think about a tech, how they're going to be this, how they're going to be that, as we see the different flows in and out of the different sectors. When, when you're considering that most of uh, investors aren't just coming into individual stocks anymore, they don't have time to do all of that work, so they give their money into the ETFs. And so they then have to distribute and put it into different places and choose where the money's going to go inside their ETF. So, and their ETFs on everything. And all of them are pretty active. So while that continues to ebb and flow, we're still sitting not knowing what that larger move is going to be. So, I'm going to rely again on Elliot. Elliot is not necessarily predictive on a day-to-day -day basis. It gives us thought. It, it allows me to give a two-sided picture. And you'll see that every, I try to do that on my Elliot Wave updates, where I'm telling you the upside and the downside potential for the following day. Not necessarily the following week, but the following day. Now, in this big picture update, that's what I'm updating, the big picture. It hasn't changed. It's still suggesting we're 
going to be cresting, topping, and a primary B wave, which will then kick off and start a primary C wave down, which does promise to be more destructive, more quick in its moving, and consist of five waves, which we know are impulsive simply because of their nature. And the impulse will be down. I am not calling for the end of the world. I am not calling for a market crash. Those will be other people's words. I do believe there will be a bottom. And what I believe will come after this primary C wave is it will put in a low for a cycle degree A wave, setting the stage for a cycle degree B wave. We're going to see this thing turn around once again. And I believe it will catch fire and it will be dynamic for trading. As much as I think that C wave down is going to be dynamic for trading. Stay open to it. Try not having an opinion. Don't trade with a bullish or bearish bias. I know a lot of us, it's just the way we are. are we're not geared for anything else. Give it a try. By the way, you may choose coaching, and there's the, I, I offer coaching. And what I do inside there is work on people's mindsets, work on people, help people to develop their own trading plan, trading rules. And how, how do we keep a mindset in place when we're being bombarded by noise? Those are difficult things. I got to tell you, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but you can develop it. Okay, back to what I'm talking about. So here on the daily, we're still looking that, well, we're still holding. Our moving averages aren't really that bad. We're still in a position where we should go up, but we've been failing to do so. We find weakness, but then they rally back to that, what I might call the point of control. Weakness, then they rally back toward that midpoint, which just happens to be 4125 to 4150 in the SPX. Let's go down to that uh, the, the four-hour chart. And here, oh, I don't need to do that. Let me, let me go there. Just open it this way. You can see that we came down. We, we, we actually went down and we tested 4,100 on Friday. Broke slightly below it. Grabbed it back and rallied up in the last hour to get ourselves back towards 41.25. Now, I want to add one additional thing that I'm catching a lot of grief about, but I got to tell you, when we think about it, it's going to behoove whether you're a swing trader, an option trader, or a futures trader to really pay attention and to try to learn about zero DTE options. Right now in the derivatives markets, zero DTE options across the board, right, are now, I think over 50% of the daily options volume. These are the options that are being traded by large firms, large HFT firms, big institutions. And this is how they are doing several things. Hedging a, a larger position that they're keeping on, either bullish or bearish, that they're keeping on. And and but but you're watching volatility swings intraday that can cause a large institution holding a position a lot of agony. Now I'm not asking that you know we need to go down to the, the to the nitty gritty and understand somebody's you know pain threshold, but this is how they're dealing with it. And what this dealing with it does is produce these moves in our market where we can watch them sell it off, which they did on Friday, but it reaches a point and you see that change and then they just start and buy it back. And what happens down here is they do what, what we call, they monetize, they monetize a put, right? The, op, the put is the right to sell. Right, A call is the right to buy. So as markets go up and you've got a zero DTE option that's going to expire on that day at the close, 
you may be looking to monetize it before it actually expires. So you're out, you're done. Now, every single option as they trade in massive amounts, right? It, it has Greeks, what we call Greeks, and those are Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, Rho, et cetera, et cetera. Each one has a meaning. The biggest one that gets traded against is the Gamma, because that's what happens to the overall position as the index moves around. So Gamma is effectively telling us all about premium. Premium is volatility. That's what volatility equates to. Premium. Now, these options expire every day. So you're coming in at a level, but your premium, you'll notice, on the options, you just get your stock price and then place it to against what the underlying is trading at. And you're going to get premium on each strike price that then gets factored in and now we got these gamma numbers which either increase or decrease as things become at the money out of the money have no value well gamma changes and that then allows institutional traders to lift put risk on or put risk off this is how it's trading now. I know it may sound complicated, and I don't think that we have to really grasp onto the finer details unless you're actually going to do that type of trading. I think it's more important that we learn how does it affect the market? Because many of us that you're listening to me, we're in there trading every day, different vehicles. Maybe we're trading the Qs, maybe we're trading the Spiders, maybe we're trading the uh, ES, the, the SPX, the options in each of those. And so you're trying to make sense out of this. And how do I really get around and how do I make money? Because let me tell you, there's been a big surge of, of investors, retail, that want to come in and grab a piece of that zero DTE option money. And they're losing. They're losing huge amounts every day with that because you have to have an understanding what the functionality is and how that all comes to fruition. My question or my my premise is learn about it before you jump in. Now, how is it affecting our market? Well, here we are in the one hour chart. Here's the bottom of four. So I'm still looking for this minor fifth wave. Now, let me back it out. And we're just going to talk and just put in some of our basic Fibonacci levels to continue to show us, well, where should we kind of come in? And first I got to put up, I got to change this, and I'm going to put up my extension. So the first one I'm going to put up is for that wave C, which still is in force. So we got to look at that. There's the ticket, 4243, because what do we want to do? We want to get, actually, it's even lower, but we want to get above 4198. 4195. That is where wave C would exceed the high of wave A, which is a guideline, which is a pretty strong guideline that Elliot gave us. When you're looking for this formation, we're looking for wave C to create either new high or low, depending on the direction of the, of the, the uh, structure. In this case, higher, we're looking for it to create a new high. Then we can attach Fibonacci to it that tells us, well, We've gotten up close. And what's our next level? Our next level is going to be 42.43 basis, the Fibonacci for the C wave. As this starts to progress and continue, we do have additional levels. And a lot of those levels really do come in play for the uh Futures market is where I've been keeping them because one of the largest, so we're in this fourth wave, excuse me, this fifth wave. And what should the fifth wave consist of? Well, five waves of minute degree. Well, we saw one, two, three, four, five come up to here. 
but it yet did not take out that high, didn't even get close. I mean, it sort of got close, but it didn't get close. So it would have been a huge failure. And even in terms of getting above wave A, an even bigger failure. So I have to go back and realize that this is very possibly, very possibly minute wave one of minor wave five. And all of this is minute wave two. So what does that leave us? Well, we have a strong possibility that we still got a third, a fourth, and a fifth on the minute degrees. So what's that tell me? We still have 42, 43s realistically in the picture. It's technical, but I can't disqualify it. I can't say it's not going to happen. Now, mind you, if it goes up, it's a finishing move. It is not the start of a new bull market. It is not a continuation of a bull market that everybody wants to determine has come at the end of October. It is not, it's not. Bull markets don't start in the conditions that we are currently residing within. It just doesn't happen that way. Go back historically and look and read what was in play at the time. What was in play at the bottom at 2009? What was in play at the bottom in March of 2020? What was in play at the bottom in 1974 to 1978, depending on what point you wanted to put it at? What was occurring there? It wasn't instability in the banking sector. It wasn't, oh my God, what are we going to do? It wasn't fighting inflation and not winning. We didn't have the sincere threat of a $2.1 trillion loss within the banking sector which in and of itself, folks, can still create havoc within the banking sector, overwhelming the Federal Reserve because they won't have this unlimited billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to flood the market to rescue depositors. So some will fail. Some will go by the wayside. And what happens? Panic. Now, you're either going to fall prey to the panic or you're going to be able to stand in the storm in all of that chaos and pull out opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and make a bloody fortune. That's all I can tell you. Now, what can we start to look for here? <laughs> well, let's take a quick look at minor wave one, which actually is pretty big. So minor wave one, we got 40... 38, and I think, uh, let me just get it right on there. And actually, 4039. And I'm going to go 0. 0.50. And then the low of that is 3805, 380886. So I'm going to call it 38. Oops. 4039. 0.50 minus 3809. So we have 230 points, and that is minor wave one. Is 238, excuse me, 230.50. Now, Elliot told us in his guidelines that when we're looking at a minor fifth wave within a five-wave structure, the most common is that minor five will be equal. So we have the equality will be equal to minor wave one. Well, we add 230. Here we have it. And that low is 4028. And I'm just going to round it off. So these are going to be approximate. Um, actually, I can. Eh, 25. We're going to call it 25. We're going to try to be as accurate as we can. And we're going to add 230.50. So now we have 4231. Bing. Look what this comes in. So we have that minor one, uh, minor five will equal minor one at 4231. You can draw a line. You can call it resistance. But at number one, it clears wave A. So wave C, wow, beautiful. But now the market's having a lot of trouble putting in a decent rally. But there, there's your first number. So what we have... I'm just going to write this down. 
minus 5 equals 42, 31, 75. Um, and then we have that the second one, again, taking 230.50, is that minor 5 will be 0. 0.618 times the length. And that's 142.45. So again, we come back down to this low. And that is, again, 40.48.25. So we'll use it, 40.48.25. And then, just pop my numbers. You please forgive me. 230.50 times 0. 0.618 is 142.45. One, I boy, this didn't work, did it? Time 0. 0.618. There you go. It's 142.45. So it's 142.45 plus we have that at 38.39. And that's 39 wrong again. Jeez, Michael, I'm not really doing all that great, am I? So 145 plus 3808. Ah, come on. 38. Ah. I'm trying to use a calculator and I'm not doing very well. 145 plus 3808 is 3953. That's not coming in right. So that one's wrong. That one's not going to happen at all. So we actually have to add it to this one. So I'm doing it wrong. 145 plus 4049. And that's 4194. And we've gotten hmm, close. That would take us up to equal. There. I didn't realize I was doing wrong. Thank you. Early morning for me here, by the way. Um. And that would just take us up to 4194. The last one that we have is that wave minor wave five would be equal to 1.618 times the length of one. And that would be, so we got 230.50 times 1.618, and that's going to equal 370 three points. I'm going to say 373 plus 40. Uh, that low. Come on, give me that low. Right there. It's 4048. 4048. And that's 4421. That's way up there. Can the market do it? Well, technically, we have to include it. Technically, we have to include it. Is that what I'm expecting? They're having trouble getting it just above wave three, let alone anything. So what I have are those two levels, is that this would be 4421. These are all SPX. We've already given the numbers in the, in the S&P. And those would be those numbers. Now, I also include additional levels in my comparison to wave five to wave three. Oh, let me just show you one nifty little trick that is actually the quick way. I did them all by hand so that you know exactly how this all works, but you can put them in by using the extensions. We go to here, we go to the, come in, the top of wave one, and we bring it over to the bottom of wave four. Now we have them. And you can see we have 40, 42, 31, 42, 43, 100% is 4281. So those were that's our that's our zone. How this market is going to get there. Now, leaving all those in place, I'm going to bring it back down here. Now, if I mark this wave one and this wave two, doesn't it make more sense? So the sincerely, what we're now looking at is the possibility that the S P or the markets are going to catch fire next week and start to move higher and get themselves a back above 4190 get us up towards 4192 get us up into that zone where we have all of this resistance laid out 
right? We got the 100 up here, 4281. We have the 618 of the larger C wave at 4243. Then we start with the minor five, 4231, 4212, 4192. Mind you, we're only looking the other, the A wave just is just below 4200. 4212 definitely comes into play. Is it possible that the market can get up 80 points from here? I would say yes, it is a possibility. It's not up to me to make it a reality. The market will tell us that, but it is possible. Now, again, what can I do? Indeed, if wave two did complete here, let's just throw another layer on this thing. Again, this is all basis the cash market. And we're going to bring it back down to here. Now we have another layer. And where is it lining up? 4205. Wow, here we are at the 4205. Perfect level. 42. And that could just, this is just for third waves. And then a four and a five. These are just so we have the potential there. Our Fibonacci relationships are telling us that. The market is stuck for good reason. It doesn't know what to do. What can overpower this week? That everything kind of takes a back seat. For whatever reason, we start to relax. Zero DTE options start to push again towards 4150 or higher. Those come into play. That's where the market will go. Trust me, it's going to go and have nothing to do with anything but just how options and volatility are trading. These are the new givens. These are the new facts. And they really do have a place in how we trade. And so they really do help put a lot of confusion. So And so again, if we continue to see, maybe we get the, the bond market, the treasuries to rally, giving more thoughts on interest rates coming back down and we get a bigger rise in the market. Remember, we're in a completing phase. We're looking for this thing. Please just get, rally yourself up there in, in a last gasp, a last hope, whatever you want to, to put around it. I'm going to take it day by day. I'm going to look for the signals and I'll go along, but I'm, I'm, I'm a day trader. I have my own trade rules that protect me. And that allow me to, to make profits no matter what the market does. But even if you're a swing trader, you still should have trade rules. And then put them in and use them. It's when you break your rules, your own rules, that you get yourself in trouble. So there's a lot of things. Again, I provide coaching on all of this. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Because you're dealing with money. Okay. So here's what we're putting together for the SPX. We still have a few more upside moves to complete minor wave five and in turn intermediate wave C and in turn primary wave B. So the counter trend rally remains in effect. Okay. And so moving averages, like I said before, they're not really getting too negative. The They're all, look at the cluster. Let me see if I can open this up even more. We got this cluster. Oops, that didn't work. Let's try that one again. Oh, you can see. The 50, flat as a pancake. The 20, flat as a pancake. The 200, flat as a pancake. Four and an eight, and they're going up. So we even with that rally, flat, 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 flat. So let's go over to the NDX. Took a long time on that S&P. And so I'm going to back this out. Let's go back out to the daily. Same deal. Except here we have in the NASDAQ, it is going up and putting in additional new highs. It has, wave C has cleared wave A. And within its fifth wave up, it's kind of suggesting that it's producing a diagonal triangle. And within that, it looks like we may be in that finishing mode. So let's start to build what resistance we're going to have. So just quick in the NASI, wanted to say, it is still in the process of completing an intermediate C wave to finish that primary B. The count still suggests 
a primary C wave down, which again, here I put in these, these initial downside, that just goes to show my support levels and the, what I've connected. I will take you out there real quick and show you. I connected the low of cycle wave two back in 1988-87 to the high of cycle five. That's the best I can do on my long-term picture right here. And that's what I'm going to be using. So here you have it. And as you can see, that's a major low. That's 126, 126 in the NASDAQ cash market. The high is 40, uh, 16,764, 65, you can call it, was the high in the cash market. That's a lot to correct. But guess, look at this. All of our fibs for corrections holds above 5,000. <laughs> That'd be a while, 5,000, that's such a major move. Yeah, it is. But it's going to be a lot of opportunity in the way down, and it still is above the 2,000 highs just before the dot-com bust almost busted the NASDAQ. It's still well above those. And that then tends to, to kind of give me a little bit of insight that even in the with the expected decline, asset managers, portfolio managers, people that have to shift and move money around for their customers or clients are still performing or they're better, or they're, they're leading to continue to invest in the larger tech titans as i call them that the belief is going to turn to that even if we go into a recession even if we go into a period of deflation that it will be tech that continues to lead us in stability you might want to call it or just that the, the uh, a portfolio that's a little bit heavier weighted in tech will do better overall against say for example the s p against Say, for example, the Dow or a lot of the ETFs. So therefore, you're going to see a lot of money being put into those stocks. And quite often, it's just prior to a major collapse. But it's not that they're, they're, they're wrong or they're silly or whatever. It's just how you do it when you're, when you're a portfolio manager or hedge fund manager, asset manager. And you've got to position yourself for a potential strong downside move. So that all remains in play. So the preference is going to be that during the next expected decline over the mid to long term, these tech stocks will perform better than the averages. So that's that gig. So that all, right? So here we have, we have all of our support coming off right now primary wave c well i'm kind of looking like it should come down to 10,400 or probably even 10,000 so yes folks in the nasdaq i am i am revising that initial number and that's just primary c i'm not dragging this out to like the to to the cycle level yet cycle wave a or cycle wave C, yes. Yes, we're looking at these lower levels. We're looking at a market that should then drop 84, 64. That's what we're looking at. But that's further out down. And it's going to have a whole set of different circumstances. And we'll deal with that when that occurs. But right now, I would say we bottomed somewhere around 10,000 to 10,400. We're going to, we will, we will be able to put much more definition around it once it begins, once we get a top and we can start calculating for lower. Now, let me come back down here quickly to this market and come out to the four hour so I can say the A, the four. Now, here again, here we have. Uh, I think that's the one I used, 12,086. 
And we're going to go to that low, which was 11,695. So we have 391. Minor one is 391. It's 391 points. So we're going to go, and if we're, we're going to use minor wave four, as where we're going to place all of ours. So the first one is equality. So we have uh, that low is 12,724, 12,724, 12, plus 391. That's 13,115 that's already gone right through it. Let me do that one again. So that equality surpassed. So now we're going to go 0.618 is not going to work either. So we have 391 times 1.618 plus 12,724. And that is 13,356. We've gotten up to 41. Do you see how close we are? Now... I've also added some additional, and we're going to do that right now as well. So we have that 12,356 number, 13,356. So I'm going to round it up to 357. That's important. We're going to keep that one in mind uh, because we've actually, no, I take it back. We've gotten over, we've gotten over 13,400. So even that one's now out. So we're going to go to uh, what, what's up going to be next. And I'm going to put these in. And we're going to put this in right there. So you can see what we have coming up. We have 13,613 in terms of the C wave. Now inside this thing, and I come back down to the hourly chart, we need to take a look at, uh, as it gets very difficult because this is minor four. And I can put one more fib on in terms of looking at minor wave two, which has to come in all the way down here. And here we have a double, 13,498. And then we have here, 13,613. I had different levels, but those are in the futures market. And this is the cash market. So it continues to roll itself around 13,455, uh, I believe. Here we have 415. So again, we, we need to take some of this off so that I can see because... What we got left is if I'm here is where I'm counting. This is the four. That's one, two, three, three, or you know, got it up here. A B C four. And if that's the case, we're doing a three wave up. And we'd be looking at 13,434, 35, up towards that 516 number. And that's more in the future than it is in the cash. If I had to use the cash, it's going to come in a little bit lower. 67 in the NASDAQ, close to four. There's still about 20. So we're looking at that 13,490, 480. So, and, and to tell you the truth, pretty much these should continue to hold. And this one, I can actually refine by removing it and putting in a new one, which connects two to four, if indeed this is going to be the end of the move. So it was deeper, but not breaking any rules, still holding to, you know, threes, three, three. I know we should do a three and come back up. Now here's the kicker. We can exceed that, get up to here, but it's going to be really strange, which it was last week as well, 
with the NASDAQ powering higher and the Dow, the Russell, and the S&P going lower. So either that's kind of reverse or the NASDAQ takes a day off while the others catch up. So it's a kind of a strange picture in terms of the markets being in unison with one another in terms of buying and selling. That may continue. So that's going to be... <laughs> excuse me, our equity markets. I need to quickly move because I promise to try to keep this a little bit shorter. I want to go over the 30-year bond. 30-year bond is continuing to present a little bit of a weird pattern. Now, again, I am looking for this for next week because I'm going to start here on, let me pull this open and this, we'll look at the daily. On the daily chart, the bonds, again, on an Elliott basis, coming off of the bond price high, rate low, which was in 2020, they've done three waves down, and this is all part of a minor four, which I will consider complete at the recent 134.14 high in the 30-year bond. And that was back at the beginning of April. Out of that... We should do five waves down of minute degree to put in the minor fifth wave. And then that sets the stage. That sets the stage for all this noise that we're getting about interest rates and how they will have to go down and likely will while the markets go down with them. A whole different set of givens and, and rules are going to be at play there. But how can that happen when we're just kind of sitting, we're doing nothing, but yet it looks like we, we're heading to break down. So what that means very short term is that rates will go up. Rates will move higher while the market fluctuates between moving higher and starting to move lower. So what I'm looking for here right now is this is my daily. So I've got the wave four and this is now the start of five waves of minute degree of which we have minute one in place, bringing this back down to the four hour chart, minute wave one in place. Minute wave C is actually just sideways action, total indecision on the interest rate market. They don't know which way to go, but it's remained pretty volatile. The 30 year bond is remaining very volatile at the moment in terms of zipping up and zipping down and how much ground it covers very quickly. So if I got a, a minute wave one, A, B, C, three waves down, X produces another A, B. I'm looking for the bond market to initially rally. And what are the, what are the markers now? What do we got going on here? Let me just continue to put this higher and then bring the whole thing down so we can see it. What I got going on is that we can rally up. Here's our resistance points. 3105, 3117, 3128, 3206, 3213, 3220, ultimately, ultimately, likely in a C wave, at least breaking above that 133. And now I have the resistance to complete at 13307. Not going above this 13414 high. That stays in place. And then it turns and we do another nosedive lower in a third wave. And look what the first one looked like. These, the volatility has been very intense. So we get up here and then we turn and we drop. So there will be something I think that comes out that's just going to upset our market. And interest rates will come, you know, tumbling back down. Now I have a larger, on the big picture, where we, we can come out and we look, and we use the same Elliott, by the way, what I have is I got to go all the way back. Whoop, got to go all the way back. And I'm talking about that we are in, in the bonds, in the 30-year bond. And now I got to compare minor wave five. And what's my comparison? Minor wave one. And actually, I think I can do it off of this chart. Minor wave one. Bing, 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 down to there. So minor wave one is equal to 30.92, 30.92. So now I can, I got something to work with now. I can come over here and I can go from there and 30.92. So what that's going to suggest 
is a minor way five the equality equality <clears throat> puts the 30-year bond down way down here at 103.22 so that number 21 that just shows and it's telling you that's how deep this market could 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 drop it i'm not looking for that right now to be honest with you what does fit is five equals 0.618 of wave one that gets us down to that one below 117, which is the wave three and the 115. 115.15 to 115.04. Put in a wave five, setting the stage for a strong bond price rally rate decrease. Notice the connection. We need to go down before we go back up, and those rates will decrease. Why is the market having so much trouble here? Indecisive. Do we go up? Do we go down? Do we break out? Do we break down? They don't have enough information as to exactly what the time frame is going to be. Do we need, are we going to go through a few more interest rate hikes by the Fed to tackle inflation? Or... Oh, gee, but you see inflation on the CPI. That was that would look pretty good. We, we've got all this adjustment going on. I want you to be very leery of those numbers. Those numbers are year over year. So they looked at March of 2022 versus March of 2023. Or April of 2022 versus April of 2023. Anybody care to go back and take a look at what April of 2022 looked like? They were nose diving. So yes, inflation improved year over year. It's, I don't know how they came up with that calculation or why they even use it, but that's the one that everybody's going to hang their hat on. We were in the throes of a, of a huge decline in treasuries in March of 20, or in April of 2023. We were in a huge decline. I'm just going to go one more out. <clears throat> ah, can't even. I got to go further. We're finishing a third wave down. I'm going to go out to the weekly. Here we are. March, April. April. Look out below. That's what they're comparing this past April. Of course, it's, it does look better. Look where we were here. Look where we were here. So the numbers are gonna they're gonna reflect it. I think it's a flawed model myself. Uh, again, compared to what you're paying and as a consumer, what we pay. Now, what are they basing it on? A month where we really saw inflation just jump a great deal, and as evidenced by bo both the markets. Okay, so that is the thirty-year bond. I'm looking for a rally and then an additional decline. And that decline coming in a fifth wave should be quick, swift, and to the point. So that's what I'm looking for there. Quickly over to the <clears throat> two-year note, which is the other one. So I mean, a lot of it's comparing the two and the 10. Ten's in total confusion right now, by the way. It's even stuck in a, in a stronger range, which I believe will yield. One more little rally, and then it also will, I think, kind of come flying down to put in its low. Now, here in the two-year note, if I take this out to the daily, you can see that it already did come down and put a minor five in an intermediate wave A. That's already done. It's done its first five down, and now we're inside of a B wave. But again, what we've done is we've done minor A. So what's going to be in this B wave, which is heading up, counter trend? It's going to be... <clears throat> A, B, C. So we're still within this B wave, which is taking its time moving sideways. Again, indecision. Well-founded. What do we do? Do we really kind of start to climb again or do we drop? It looks like I think that we drop pretty quickly, bringing it back down towards 102.065. Put in a C wave, right? So we got a one, two. That's on the daily chart. Let me break it down to the hourly. You know, we got a one. All right, so we got one, two, one, maybe a two. And here's where we're going to end up. Actually down a little bit lower. Here. Closer to here. So we got to do get five in. Then 
Let me bring it back out. What we're really looking at is an ABC. That's going to be the B wave. Then we get a decent rally up, which it again takes above that 104 high that we saw in March. And that then would be the B wave. And then once again, folks, we're going to be looking at some pretty serious interest rate hikes. That's what the wave pattern is telling me, but that's out there, out there. It's not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen next month. It's out there. We got a lot to go for. And then we still have a C wave up, B wave finishing down, a C wave up. And once we're back likely out to these lofty levels, then we have a major decline. And that, I believe, will coincide with a much larger decline in our equity markets. And so that's still out there, yet to come. All right, I'm going to continue very quickly here now. And I want to go over and just talk a little bit about gold and silver. Not easy wave patterns, but I believe we're subdividing, 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 and we're just going to continue to explode higher. But <clears throat> gold is getting itself all caught up in its own moves, trying to reflect against what or how things should be trading because uh, our, our biggest... Our biggest deterrent from any rally in gold is if the dollar strengthens. The dollar strengthens, we're selling gold. The gold prices will be sold. And when the dollar loses ground, right, a weak dollar pushes the price of gold higher. Other factor that remains in play right now and basically comes in early, it'll start during the European session and carry over into the beginning of our RTH sessions here in gold, and that is central bank buying. They're continuing to see central bank buying. And that remains strong. And it helped us spike uh, at the beginning of May up to that 2085 level, I think it was. Yeah, 2085. Now we come all the way back down, touch almost 2000. So whether we're actually done with this, uh, this is minute, this is minuet, this is sub sub again one two it should it's actually coming kind of come down and equal we might see a little bit lower i'm not looking for it to really go below this but it might it might come down and test 2000 or it just turns and starts to take off and then finally get itself above there so gold remains i think in a positive stance but not easy to trade if you're a day trader, it's producing a lot of opportunity, but you got to be quick on your feet and you've got to really have good, solid trade rules and always, always work with the stop and gold. The reversals, the turns can be vicious and move suddenly. And I'm talking, you know, at, at a buck, a, a buck, a, uh, a, you know, 10 cents. So a tick is 10 cents in, in gold. That's, that's, $10. So each tick is $10. So each dollar is $100. And gold will flip, say, for example, between 2015 and 2020, like zippity doo da. You got a $500 trade against you or with you. So it can move very, very quickly. Silver. Silver also, now silver did start to play catch up. And we saw silver get all the way back up above 26. That I believe completed a minute wave one, and then we got this. Whoa, get out of the get out of the water, and that is very indicative of a second wave. Second waves can be just a sudden reversal, boom, and that's what we got. So we put up some fibs to give us a little covers to where we can come down to. This was actually for the rally back up. If I take these out and I go over and just put in fibs for this decline. We're going to be covering wave one, right? We've just actually hovering around 0.382, more common, 50 to 618. That's 23, 2330 to 2250. And I can do it and then start to rally again. A little bit cleaner here in silver than it is in gold. But we were looking for gold to pick up the pace and get itself above 25. It did. But you see, its comfort zone is not 25. The comfort zone is 24 to 23 right now, and maybe even a little bit lower, but we'll see. 
So I'm looking for a little bit lower in silver and then an additional rally to pick up. Whether it gets there all the way or stops here and rallies again, it depend on what the market does. And lastly today, I want to take a look at the dollar index. And the dollar index is stubborn as it is. So basically what I'm saying, <clears throat> the dollar index is as confused as the markets. You can see they did a nice rally, but they managed to close it so it would close in a red bar. And actually, this is the daily and closed. Look at that. Like negative, negative. And I'd be thinking, we're not going to go up. So we remain in that position. I'm leaving my labeling as is an A, A, B. If anything, if the rally does pick up and continue, then maybe we will get that A, B, and we get a C. But it's at this stage, it's very likely just going to be a flat. So the A, the B equal in length, the C way should also equal it. So we're really not looking for much more than just a rally back towards 106, which seems like an eternity from where we are. And then we begin a much larger decline in the dollar. And that would be in the terms of a minor C wave. And this was minor A. So if we get a flat here and you're looking for something that's going to be that big, that's going to be, you know, 14, 15, somewhere around in there. And it's going to start from here. You're looking at well below par and somewhere down around 95, 96. So... Yeah, somewhere down in here for this, for the C wave. Now, what did that do for gold? Well, get out of the pool. It's going to rally like you wouldn't believe. What's that going to do for the bond market? What's that going to do for equities? We shall see. Right? We shall see. I'm going to finish it all right there. I want to thank you uh, for uh, listening with me today. I know the bulk is also sp always spent in the SPX and the NDX. Hopefully you picked up something in the bonds. If you need more information, please feel free to ask. I will do my best to uh, put a little bit more detail if you ask. And for the balance, I, I will make another quick Elliott Wave update. Those will be just confined to the futures market. So again, I'll wait for Globex to open this afternoon, evening, and then we'll be covering the uh, ES, the NQ, and very likely the 30-year uh, bond. For the balance, have a great Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Have a great Mother's Day. And our next update will be the Elliott Wave update this afternoon.